Uh, the uh, a couple other quick items. Uh, if you if you're interested in going to the Wildlife Science Center, please reply by uh, tomorrow. Uh, a lot of you have already done that. Looks like we'll have at least 20 people going. That's great. And the newsletter I, that came out today, so probably you've seen it in your mailbox already. That's great. Um, oh, for, uh, Randy accidentally set this up as a meeting instead of a webinar, so there's no Q&A tonight. Um, so just use chat to uh, answer your questions. Oh, yes, the other thing we ask people to do is, and do this in the chat, if there's more than one person on your device, please let us know how many people are on your device. Uh, just type it in the chat so we can count the number of people that are that are actually listening. That lets us keep our statistics. Um, beyond that, I will uh, start introducing. Any, anybody else have an announcement? Okay. Uh, I'll uh, summarize George's introduction here. Uh, George is the research group manager for the Minerals and Mer Metallurgy Strategic Research Platform at the Natural Resources Research Institute, an applied research lab that is part of the University of Minnesota system, uh, the Mun University of Minnesota system research enterprise. In that role, he guides the overall strategic uh, plan for this platform. He's, uh, I'm not going to read all the, uh, the text that he has. I, there's a very large introduction here, but you really don't want to listen to me speak about George, and he can say anything he wants to if he needs to. I'm just going to send it over to you, George. All right, that sounds good, Dave. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I was, I was telling uh, Steve and Randy and Dave that um, I'm honored to, uh, to be spending Valentine's Day with you guys. Uh, and having you guys listen to me rather than going out for a fancy dinner or something like that. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I want to thank Steve uh, for the invitation to give this, uh, give this presentation tonight. And also, I want to thank uh, Randy and Dave for, uh, for uh, um, all the technical work and uh, all the behind the scenes work they did to, to make this happen tonight. So, so thanks a lot, guys. Um, yeah, I'm George Hudak. I'm the research group manager for the minerals and metallurgy group here at the Natural Resources Research Institute. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, just a little bit about my background. I grew up down in New Ulm, uh, went to Carleton College for my undergrad degree, and then came up to UMD and got uh, put onto a really great project with the Geological Survey of Canada, where I was looking at uh, exploration efficiencies and new ways to use volcanology to find uh, copper and zinc deposits in Precambrian, actually in and 2.7 billion year old rocks. And uh, uh, did a good enough job on that that I was invited to do a PhD on it, finish that up. And then for 11 years, uh, I was uh, the economic geology and mineralogy professor at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And um, I, I spent a lot of time in Duluth and I really miss Lake Superior. So um, I got an opportunity to come back up here to the NRI in 2009 and jumped on it and uh, have been doing Minnesota-based research uh, pretty much ever since. So tonight, what I really would like to, to talk about is uh, kind of a very timely topic, which is all about uh, life cycle and circular economy concepts and, and how they, they may apply to Minnesota's mineral resources. Um, this is a really important topic in light of the fact that we're, we're really going from a carbon-based economy toward uh, a renewable uh, or a, a, a more renewable energy type economy. Um, that's, that's the prediction for the next 30 to 50 years. And um, this, is gonna, this is gonna take a lot of minerals. And um, I'll, I'll show some statistics and things like that about, uh, about how this is gonna be, um, uh, you utilized or how we're going to utilize minerals in this this new uh, uh, kind of green economy. Um, but what I'll do beforehand and, and kind of the outline for the talk tonight is to give a brief introduction to the NRI, 
Um, I'll, I'll also give a brief summary of some of the mineral resources that we have in the Lake Superior area, as well as in Minnesota. And then I'll put out some kind of basic definitions about life cycle and circular economy concepts. And then uh, really spend a bunch of the talk uh, kind of reviewing some of the recent literature and some recent findings um, that talk about mineral resource use at least up to 2050 and in some cases beyond. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how the circular economy approach for minerals res mineral resources um, could be developed in Minnesota based on some work that we're doing here at the NRI. And then finally, I'll wrap it up to talk about whether or not uh, the circular economy for mineral resources is actually possible. Um, so with that said, um, just to get a brief introduction to the NRI, uh, those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, the NRI was formed in 1983 um, by a charter from the Minnesota legislature to foster the economic development of Minnesota's natural resources in an environmentally sound manner and to promote private sector employment. Um, if you all recall, or those of you that were around Minnesota in 1983, you know, at that time, the Iron Range was going through some really troubled economic times and, and Rudy Perpich pushed this, pushed this through and we've been here ever since doing work. So our mission is really to deliver integrated research solutions that value our resources, environment and economy for a sustainable and resilient future. And what we're really trying to do is, is to discover the economy of the future as it relates to Minnesota's natural resources. So uh, that's really what it's about. Um, the NRI uh, has about 140 scientists, engineers, and technicians and staff. We have two campuses. Uh, our primary campus is, is in Duluth, uh, up by the airport. If you drive uh, through Duluth and then head up to, to Virginia or go up, uh, up to the International Falls using Highway 53, uh, you drive right by our building. Uh, it's very easy to recognize. It's uh, eight stories high. A uh, concrete kind of bunker that has three windows in it. It has an interesting history. It used to be the Strategic Air and Ground Environment Building um, back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, basically, it housed the computers that had the radar that looked over uh, Canada and the North Pole at at our uh, at the Soviet Union. Um, back in 1983, that was donated to the state, and we've turned it into the Natural Resources Research Institute. If you ever get an opportunity to visit, give me a call and I'd be more than happy to give you a, a brief tour of the place. It's a really interesting place. I always think of it as kind of a, a think tank within the University of Minnesota system. Um, we also have a 20, 27 acre uh, industrial site that's located in Coleraine about five miles east of Grand Rapids. That used to be US Steel's National Research Lab. And we do a lot of different uh, uh, experiments there, primarily related to minerals characterization, uh, minerals processing, lots of metallurgical processing, um, biomass processing, and ener energy and materials research. The thing about the Coleraine Lab, which makes the NRI a bit unique, is that um, we can do everything from the test tube all the way up to tons per hour, which is really kind of unique within a university setting. So um, when it comes to doing uh, kind of pilot scale experiments. We're a go-to place for many uh, industrial clients as well as for many research uh, applications because we were able to do this big scale work. Um, with that said, uh, you know, our core values are very similar to most, uh, most uh, uh, industry core values. Uh, main focus always is on safety, but obviously quality, innovation, integrity, and collaboration and partnership are also kind of our core values, especially the collaboration and partnership. We collaborate with a lot of, of uh, industry partners. We collaborate with lots of academic and agency partners. And we also partner with a lot of people to, and a lot of groups to, uh, to come up with uh, ideas and to develop uh, experiments to test those ideas and, and, and develop products if possible. Um, so, what are platforms here at the NRI? We, we basically have three uh, fundamental platforms, uh, the Applied Ecology and Resource Management Platform, the Minerals and Metallurgy Platform, and the Materials and Bioeconomy Platform. Um, our Applied Ecology and Resource Management focuses on the living part of the natural environment. So it's all the theologists other than geologists are part of that. Our Materials and Bioeconomy Platform 
focuses on increasing the economic return from Minnesota's forest harvest by developing value-added products. And things that we've been working on are things like thermally modified wood, natural products and extractives, as well as um, uh, biofuels. And then the minerals and metallurgy platform strives to define our mineral resources and demonstrate competitive and responsible use of those resources. Um, as such, our program has expertise in economic geology, development of secondary products, mineral processing, pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy. And, and this allows us to work in major programs focused on characterizing Minnesota's current and potential resources, um, uh, including our iron of the future research, uh, research into metallic waste reprocessing, recycling, and various components of geological energy storage. Um, we're also doing quite a bit of work, as I'll show later on, right now with the US Geological Survey on evaluating potential for critical metals in the state. Um, so together, these, these three platforms um, uh, contribute to our, our data collection and delivery platform. The data collection and delivery really develops uh, various types of tools that are available to the public for understanding things about natural resources. Um, and our commercialization services platform allows us to, when we make inventions, to, to get that IP and allows the university to get royalties from that, that uh, intellectual property that we develop. Um, so really, one of the things that we'll be discussing in, in my presentation that's going to be a really a, a focus of this presentation is the whole idea of innovation. And um, when, when we talk about innovation, this is really coming up with new ideas to solve old problems. Um, and maybe new problems that arise as we develop uh, new economies and new ways of, of doing things as a society. Um, so really there's four fundamental parts to, to doing innovation. The first part, and it's the part that I'm mostly involved in is really understanding our resources, uh, doing strategic resource assessments um, and figuring out what we can do with our local resources. And this really requires innovative thinking because um, the whole idea here is to, to really diversify the product portfolio and to create economic opportunity and to, to continually think about how we can use our natural resources to develop higher value products that bring more money to the state and better jobs to the state and better sustainability for our communities. Um, a key part of that is to reduce waste. Um, you know, Waste is bad business, not only for the bottom line, but also obviously for the environment. And so some of the things that we've been doing to reduce waste is, for example, taking taconite tailings and developing kind of state-of-the-art pothole patches. We've got a big project on that right now, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. And then also thinking about things like carbon sequestration using mine, potential mine waste materials. Um, and also, finally, embracing life cycle thinking is really important. And when we're talking about life cycle thinking, the way to think about it is, what we're putting into the pipe is as important as what's coming out of the pipe. So in other words, you gotta think about the whole life cycle of the resource from discovery to processing, to development of the product, and then what happens to that product when it's uh, useful life is, is done. Um, and so uh, this is really all about uh, kind of key components that, that relate to the, to the circular economy. So uh, the United Nations has a whole bunch of sustainable development goals, and there's 17 of them. And really what we focus on at NRI are those that are fundamentally related to natural resources. So those would be things like uh, uh, clean, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, uh, decent work and economic growth. I mean, that's really the focus of the NRI. We're an economic development group that uses science to understand that. Industry, innovation and in infrastructure, sustainable cities, and communities, responsible consumption and production. This is a real key thing within, within the uh, circular economy. Obviously climate action, life below water and uh, life on land and then partnerships. So these are really the things that we focus on here at the NRI. All right, enough, enough with the, uh, the advertisement for what we do at the NRI. Let's get on to the, the meat and potatoes of the talk. Um, so before we discuss various concepts related to the circular economy, um, I'd like to step back and do a quick overview of both the mineral and water resources in our region and in our state. And as you can see from the map on the screen, 
The Lake Superior region is endowed with a wide variety of mineral resources. And those resources are associated with really three fundamentally different terrains of different ages that occur within the Lake Superior area. Uh, the rocks in the green, I, hopefully you can see my, my cursor, but the rocks in the green and blue here represent the really ancient Neoarchean greenstone belts that cross in a north, north, uh, north uh, east to southwest pattern across northern Minnesota, the lower one being the Wawa Wawa Abitibi terrain and the upper one being the Wabagoon terrain with the Quetico subprovince sandwiched in between it. Um, the Paleoproterozoic gauge greenstone belts that comprise the Wisconsin magmatic terrain. This is in, in this region here of Wisconsin, and you can see by all the stars that uh, this area has is very highly fertile for things like copper zinc deposits. In fact, it's 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 got lots and lots of, of copper zinc mineralization in the forms of volcanic associated massive sulfide deposits. And it ends up that these rocks are exactly the same age as, as rocks that occur up in northern Manitoba and Saskatchewan, which looks some very similar volcanic coasted massive sulfide deposits, uh, such as in the Flin Flon and Snow Lake camps up there. And then finally, we have the Animiki Basin right here. And this is probably, if you're thinking about a basin in the United States, the most important economic basin in the United States, because it hosts all of our iron ore on the Mesabi Range, as well as the iron ores that were, that were mined and currently are still mined uh, within Michigan within the Menominee Range and the Marquette Range. Um, and the previous mining that happened in uh, uh, kind of the, the southwestern part of the UP and northwestern Wisconsin within the Gogebic Range. Um, um, along with this though, we have to consider that um, the Lake Superior area is, is, is the real focus of Lake Superior area is Lake Superior along with obviously Lake Michigan and a bit of Lake, Lake Huron um, and that, with Lake Superior, Minnesota is adjacent to uh, about 10% of the world's uh, fresh water. Um, and our watersheds extend northward, westward, and southward, and ultimately feed the Gulf of Mexico and eastward to the, to the uh, Hudson's Bay area and eastward to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, if we think about Minnesota's hard rock portfolio, um, we can break it down by rocks of different ages. Again, the 3.6 billion year old rocks down here in the Minnesota River Valley um, have done a lot with in terms of dimension stone for well over 100 years. Um, those areas within the greenstone belts have very high prospectivity for these volcanic hosted massive sulfide deposits for orogenic or load gold silver deposits. Uh, they were mined for Algoma type iron deposits. Any of you that have gone to the Sudan mine know that. Uh, that, that's in an Algoma type 2.7 billion year old uh, iron formation. And there's also potential for things like rare earth elements. And obviously there are some dimension stones quarries within these, within these rocks as well. And then within the Animiki Basin, uh, this, this area right in here, this hosts the Bawabic iron formation, which is uh, the source of all of 85% uh, of, of the iron ore mined in, in, uh, in uh, the United States. And it hosts the historic mining areas down in the Cuyuna district, which uh, right now also are being looked at uh, for their prospectivity because they, those iron formations locally have very high manganese contents and manganese is one of the key metals for the, uh, for the new uh, renewable economy. Um, the mid-continent rift area at about 1.1 billion years ago, this is really the Duluth complex as well as the North Shore volcanics. And we're all familiar with the copper, nickel, platinum group element deposits uh, that make up the various deposits that companies like Polymet and Tech and Twin Metals uh, are looking at. But also these, these age rocks host uh, some really interesting oxide rich intrusions that contain significant quantities of both titanium and vanadium. And we're currently doing some research on those. In fact, we just finished a big project on these uh, where we looked at whether or not we could actually get high purity vanadium and titanium project products uh, out of these resources by using hydrometallurgy. And, and they both, uh, both of those uh, uh, bent scale and, and low, small pilot scale studies were successful in doing that. Um, and then finally, uh, in Southeastern Minnesota, obviously we have lots of dimension stone, uh, silica sand, 
as well as limestone that's used for, for various kinds of aggregate. And then across the state, we have all kinds of different aggregates as well as uh, clays that are associated with our, with our glacial, uh, glacial uh, um, uh, deposits that are generally less than 10,000 years old in the state. Um, a key, uh, key component um, uh, really is in, in understanding mineral resources is really understanding watersheds. Water quality is the key natural resource issue related to mineral resource development and utilization. And the map uh, shown on the, on the left of this slide just shows the various large watersheds that occur within the, within the state of Minnesota. And you can see that those watersheds the Red River and Rainy River uh, head north, uh, or uh, the uh, Rainy River and Red River head north up to Hudson's Bay. Uh, the uh, obviously the the uh, Great Lakes watershed heads into Lake Superior. The Upper Mississippi River watershed uh, heads over into the Mississippi River and drains southward uh, down to New Orleans and and Louisiana. And then the Missouri River watershed is is located here in the southwestern part of the state. But anytime you're thinking about mineral resource development, this is what you got to be thinking about. Water is, is really the key. And as we're aware with some of the uh, different types of uh, uh, thinking that's going on with respect to some, uh, um, uh, with respect to potential development of the Duluth complex natural resources, a lot of what we hear in, in, in those conversations is, is all about water and just fully so. All right, let's get on to talking a little bit about life cycle and circular economy concepts. Um, and I, I really wanna talk about what, what sustainability is. So back in the late 1980s, the United Nations published the Brundtland Commission Report, which redefined sustainable development in terms of three pillars. And those three pillars were the growth of the economy, protection of the natural resources of the environment and social responsibility. And these three pillars really hold up what we, what we term as sustainable development. Um, in terms of um, uh, sustainable, sustainable development, um, it's really defined as, as the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this is really what we're talking about in terms of, of sustainability. We're really trying to understand how we can manage natural resources in a way that we can, we can utilize them now, but we don't compromise their use in future generations. Now the concept of sustainable mining um, has, has, or the concept of sustainability has recently been applied to the extraction of mineral resources by uh, Bob Seal, who's a really well-known economic uh, geologist and environmental economic geologist, in fact, with the US Geological Survey. And again, the concept of sustainable mining development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs really, really is all about, uh, you know, it's really the definition of sustainability. And really what Bob has, has, has brought forth is the idea that this concept extend beyond the availability of non-renewable mineral commodities. And it also includes aspects of econ economic, environmental and social effects of mineral resource development as shown in this kind of bubble diagram that I, uh, I've shown from a uh, publication by McCanda Wire and Oaks back in 2015, where the three pillars, economy, society, and the environment all cross over. And you notice we're all three cross right in the middle of the diagram here, we have sustainability. Now let's talk about different kinds of economies. Um, really, if we're going to understand what a circular economy is, we really have to look at kind of two end member, end member economies. Um, one end member is what we call a linear economy, which fundamentally is, is mine it, process it, build it, use it, uh, fix it, and then dispose of it model. And it's really kind of a model that uh, we've, we've used, I mean, up until just the very recent, you know, uh, we've all been in, in you know, driven around the state where we've seen old cars kind of dumped out in a farm field or dumped out in the woods somewhere. Um, you know, this is the idea of we use it and then eventually we just kind of throw it away. Unfortunately, this has happened in the past with, with mines as well, where 
um, when, when the um, mine is developed, operated, um, and then when the resource is no longer economic to extract, it's often uh, been abandoned. And, and that's really a, a linear economy kind of thing. It's not sustainable. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is not what we're gonna be able to do in the future if we're gonna utilize our mineral resources in the, in the proper way. We've gotta do, got do better than this. So in a circular economy, um, the circular economy is based on principles of designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. Um, the real focus of this is to reduce waste and the utilization of primary resources. So what you try to do is, is uh, bring primary resources into the circle and then to keep them moving throughout that circle in perpetuity um, uh, so that you can uh, basically minimize the amount of resource that you need to, to add constantly as, as we continue to, to, to move forward in time. The other idea is to reduce waste. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit. Um, enormous programs right now going on, funded by the federal government to understand how to reutilize waste. And in particular, uh, various types of mine waste and particular, a lot of things going on in terms of electronic waste as well. So in a circular economy, fundamentally you reuse what you can, recycle what can't be reused, repair what's broken, and remanufactured items that can't be repaired. Um, this is not a simple thing to do because we have to battle the second law of thermodynamics in particular entropy, which is a measure of the randomness or order within a system. Things never get more organized, they always get more disorganized basically according to entropy. Um, therefore, from a solely scientific perspective, uh, success in a circular economy is gonna require uh, um, excellence in geological, environmental, metallurgical, chemical, and biological sciences, along with engineering. Um, and, and here just, I, I've shown an example of kind of e-waste. If you think about e-waste um, and you think about the amount of gold that's in electronics, it, it rivals what some of the richest mines are in terms of grams per ton. And so the idea here would be to eventually be able to take all of this material recycle it and pull out the metals that the, the, the very important and, and in many cases critical metals that are major components of these electronics goods. So this is just an, an example of, of that. So in, in more detail, utilization of the primary resources and wastes are minimized by reuse, repair, and remanufacturing items and by recycling items that have reduced, uh, that have reached the end of their, 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 their lifetime. So basically what we do is put these into the system, we manufacture them, we distribute them, we use them. And then if they've reached the end of their life, we recycle them. Uh, if we, um, if, we, if they're, they're still our major components, we take back those goods and reutilize them. And in some cases, we're able to reuse, repair, or remanufacture them. So you try to keep within this closed loop within the circular economy. Now, um, in this diagram, which I took from Stahill's publication in 2016, one of the things that they talk about here is, is, is innovation. And uh, they, they basically kind of show that in this blue area, this is where innovation should be focused. But... I would argue that innovation plays a role in all of the key components, uh, all the way from extraction of the goods uh, um, to utilization of the goods, and then finally to reuse, repair, remanufacture, and recycling. So this is really kind of the key to, these are the key components of understanding a circular economy. How do we take those materials that we've already produced and reutilize them so that we can minimize waste and so that we can minimize the use of, of, of uh, new extracted virgin resources. Um, there was a, there's been a couple of papers recently. Uh, for those of you that are interested in the circular economy, I certainly recommend that you uh, just do a Google search on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They really focus on circular economy concepts and they have a lot of really interesting uh, um, literature and, and diagrams and things like that associated with their website. So I, I, I strongly encourage you to, to do that. But basically, um, when we think about 
the circular economy for technical materials. Um, uh, uh, in the linear economy, we would mine, process, do metallurgical processing or mineral processing followed by metallurgical processing. We'd fabricate a material. We take that material and produce a product. We consume that product and then we dispose of it. Um, so that's you know basically the linear economy is shown by all these things that are connected by black arrows. In the circular economy, um, we're gonna try to, as we consume them, when they reach the end of their life, we'd like to recycle them. And we can do that by re reprocessing them metallurgically. Um, we can recycle them by reusing that, that material. We can remanufacture them, we can repair them, or we could just reuse them over and over again. I, I mean, how many kids have hand-me-down bicycles? That's a really good, uh, simple explanation for what a circular economy is, all right? So really the idea is to develop all these different pathways that we see in green. This is what the circular economy is really trying to do. It's to get us away from taking that last arrow to disposal and instead continue to utilize those resources for long, long periods of time so that we can minimize this and minimize this. One of the big components of this is, is life cycle assessment. And, and you could really get into, I mean, I could spend a week talking about life cycle assessment. Um, but what we really are talking about is understanding um, kind of the cradle to grave processes that occur with, a, with the natural resources. And if you notice that in a life cycle assessment, if we think about kind of the pathway, we would, we would acquire the raw material, we would process it, we would manufacture it, we'd use it, and then it would come to its end of life. And that's where we have to make, make decisions. In the circular economy, we reuse it, we remanufacture it, we recycle it, okay? Or we recycle it along this path. But notice by doing that, what we're minimizing are the inputs of material and energy all the way throughout the system, as well as waste and pollution throughout the system. And that's really what this is all about, trying to minimize uh, waste products and pollution. And again, trying to minimize those inputs from new resources and the consumption of energy to, to develop those new resources. A key thing related to the circular economy, and in fact, it related to any development of any natural resource um, project is this idea of a social license to operate. And the social license to operate refers to the level of acceptance or approval by local communities and stakeholders of organizations and their operations. In other words, it's basically getting the go ahead from local communities and stakeholders to operate within their community. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of really good information on this. I took some of this from, from a, the website listed here, as well as a publication by Moffitt et al. back in 2016. But gaining the social, social license is a real process. Um, you know, at first you have to prove uh, basically to those stakeholders and those local communities that your project has legitimacy. And then by, by being transparent about it, you show that they have credibility and eventually that, that group will gain trust that your project is, is viable and is good for them, is good for society as a whole, and will give you the social license to operate. This isn't something that you apply for from the state. It's something that you have to gain by gaining the trust of the stakeholders and the local, local communities. And on the right side, I just have a diagram, a little table here that I took from sociallicense.com, which talks about these different levels of social, social license acceptance. Um, so basically when it's withheld or withdrawn, you're just gonna see things like shutdowns, blockades, boycotts, sabotage, local challenges to the project, acceptance or tolerance. There's lingering or reoccurring issues and threats. The president of outside NGOs will do watchful monitoring. Um, to make sure that you're you're being consistent with what you're saying, your operation is consistent with what you're saying, or your plans are consistent with what you're saying, and they actually pan out. Then there's approval and support. Uh, that's when the the company is seen as a good neighbor, and the stakeholders and and local communities really take pride in achieving the company's goals to to operate. And finally, you have to have the psychological component of it, which is that you you basically gain the the support 
uh, politically, you gain uh, um, support of it from, from the communities and, and people within the communities and stakeholders um, basically uh, assist in co-management of the project in the long run. So this is a really important thing. A good example of, of this recently that, that occurred, if you wanna look up the history of the Eagle Mine in Michigan, um, I think the Eagle Mine is, is a, a really interesting model. And if you read the history of what they did to actually uh, gain the social license to operate in, in that area, it, it really follows along with this pathway that I've, I've described on this slide. So I, I encourage you to take a look at, at the history of the Eagle Mine. It's an interesting, it's an interesting case study in, in this. Um, in terms of um, uh, risks, there are a whole lot of risks related to new mining or, or any kind of natural resource, resource project. Um, the risks that, that are present include the operational risks. So this includes things like technical risk, which in, in, in the case of mineral resources would be geological and metallurgical risks. Are the deposits there? Can we process them economically to get the, the resources? Um, as well as internal organizational and management risks. Um, financial and economic risks um, are also a key risk that, that occurs. Um, can you gain capital to develop your project? Um, are the markets there? And are there methods to achieve uh, efficiencies to control the costs? Um, there are legal, political, and social risks. Um, there's all kinds of legal constraints, obviously, on how we operate. Um, political instability, it, it's not such a big thing in the United States, but in other parts of the world, this can be a really key risk in terms of developing mineral resources. And obviously the social license fits into this. There's the health and safety risks. Um, and that's related in part to how safely operations can be product, uh, conducted both on and off site um, and their potential effects off site. And last but not least, certainly the environmental risks. Um, which are related to both internal environmental policies that are that are used by the operator, as well as risks associated with the production of pollution that extend beyond the the uh, the boundaries of of that project. So these are all the things that need to be need to be thought about. And again, I, I took this from a publication by Badry et al. in 2012. Um, lots of stuff to be thinking about when we're trying to understand how to develop new mineral resources. And there's a great paper by uh, a colleague of mine, Michelle Jabrac, and, and another uh, 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 geologist, uh, Jean-Marc Montel. Um, and that, that paper came out in Mineralogy Magazine a few years ago um, called Educating the Resource Geologist of the Future. And, and what it does is it places the project manager here in the middle of this, this circle. And these are all the different things that need to be thought about in terms of developing that project. So it, it really does, um, I think, lay out the, the fact that as we're developing these projects, we're not just thinking about uh, the ore and we're not just thinking about um, can we make money with the ore, but we have to consider all these different other aspects that, that come into play to effectively be able to develop a project, gain that social license, and to understand economically and, and politically um, uh, the value of that, of that, of that project. Um, and, and really, uh, this just, this just kind of, I've been in this situation. And uh, when I saw this diagram, it, 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 it kind of cleared the fuzz in my brain when I, when I was back doing, doing exploration related work and thinking about some of these kinds of things. All right, um, let's move on. Uh, we're gonna talk, we're gonna end up talking about the, the, uh, the circular economy and whether it's really, really, uh, something that can be achieved for mineral resources. But before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit about the pressure on mineral resources. Um, uh, we have to think about key global factors related to mineral resource demands, which include increasing demand for metals as global lifestyles improve across the world. Uh, the uh, transition from, uh, from the, uh, the carbon-based economy to the low carbon society is spelled out in the Paris Climate Agreement. The downsizing of the global minerals industry as a result of that sector of the economy and of the market being considered a risky investment relative to other investments. The effects of recent environmental and social disasters associated to mine sites 
For example, um, you know, just a few years ago, we all recall some of these disasters that we saw down in South America where tailing stands collapsed and led to the deaths of hundreds of people. You know, clearly that's, that's, not, that's not something we wanna see. Um, and the fact that over time, uh, ore grades decrease over time. There's some interesting charts that, for example, show the, the average grade of nickel back 100 years ago was something on the order of maybe 5%. And now we're looking at the average grade being on the order of 1% or less. So ore grades decrease over time. Um, and and that's, a, that's a real tough thing to, to deal with when you're trying to, to uh, move forward with, with minerals projects. Um, so as a result, there's an increasing pressure to more effectively extract resources from ores, byproducts, co-products, and waste products. This is part of the circular economy, that cycle I showed uh, uh, just in those two diagrams previously. And obviously more effectively, more effective utilization of the infrastructure associated with, with mining over the, mining and minerals processing over the long term. And we're going to talk about that in a, a little bit. But really fundamentally, what it comes down to is we need to innovate in order to succeed. We've got to get over these barriers if we're going to be able to produce the metals or the minerals that we, we require for uh, the new economy and, and, and society as, as we continue to, to develop over time. Um, where do we get our metals? This is called the metal wheel and it was published in a, a, by Steinbach and Wellner back in 2010. And it, it's a really interesting diagram. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through it. But basically, um, uh, you know, less than 50 years ago, only about half of the periodic table had industrial uses. But with the advent of, of all kinds of new technologies, electronics, things like that, um, nearly all, if not all of the 92 geologically naturally occurring elements on the earth now have industrial and technical uses. So this metal wheel is, is a really important way to think about where we get those resources. So those elements that occur in the inner two rings, right here, this kind of bluish gray one, and then this kind of, I don't know, pale green one, um, this is the primary geo, geosphere metal resources. And when we're thinking about going after and mining mineral deposits, commonly our, our decisions to mine those are based on economically, can we extract those resources in large quantities? They basically kind of form the foundation for the economics of doing a, doing a minerals project. Now, the second ring, which is the secondary geo, geosphere metal resource thing, indicates some of the co-products that are associated with mining of these various, these various commodities, okay? And then the third uh, uh, sphere around here in this kind of olive green is, is the byproduct uh, geosphere. And this again is related to things that um, may potentially be developed, but sometimes are not developed because economically it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. But what I wanna point out here is all these elements that have the red circles around them. And those red circles are around the minerals that are considered critical minerals or critical metals by the USGS and, and other nations. And if you notice that, yes, some of these are primary sources, nickel, titanium, magnesium, manganese, and zinc, they're, they're primary, they're, they're things that you, we hear about a, a manganese miner, we hear about a zinc miner, a titanium miner, a nickel mine, um, but we don't often hear about a gallium or germanium or indium mine um, uh, or you know a rhodium mine, okay? So what ends up happening is the economics of these primary resources in part dictate the availability of the secondary and tertiary critical metals that we require for some of these new technologies that we use, including the new green economy or the, the carbon-free energy, energy storage and energy, energy production that we're pushing for uh, by 2050. Um, so I, I think it's really important to understand that a lot of the metals that we use are really byproducts of the mining of some other primary metal. And uh, really, it's, it's these 
metals and these minerals within this, this first two uh, uh, parts of this, this circle that really dictate whether or not we have accessibility to these other metals that we use uh, so often. So this is a really Im important diagram. Um, we also talk a lot about, and we hear in the, in the news a lot that, you know, recycling is, is the answer to, to uh, our problems in terms of metals supply. Um, it, it absolutely is, but one, one of the things that um, we're dealing with is, is there are technological, there are technological barriers right now to being able to recycle all the metals that we use. Okay, and, and what I did was I, I put up this diagram uh, from the UN and also from a couple of academic publications in recent years that talk about the recycling rates for various metals. And you can see that for a good number of metals, we recycle over 50%. That's great. That's fantastic. That's really doing well. Um, for things like iridium, magne magnesium, and, and molybdenum, we recycle about 25 to 50% of the product. So anywhere from 50 to 75% of that material at the end of the life of a product is going to waste. That, that's not good. For cadmium, ruthenium, and tungsten, it's 10% it's, uh, to about 25% is able to be recycled. Um, for things like antimony and mercury, it's only one to 10%. And for the others, and this includes the really important uh, elements as the rare earth elements, right now we, we can't recycle more than about 1% of that material because as we develop these new alloys for these new, new products, we end up, uh, um, it, it's really hard to pull them apart uh, at the end of their life. Um, the metallurgy is really complicated and um, it, it really is, is economically and technically challenging to do that. So I just wanted to, you know, give you an idea of what, what the reality is in terms of recycling right now. This is kind of the, the state of the art as, as to where we are in terms of recycling. Um, it's, it's going to be an important component and obviously innovation is needed here to improve these rates because that's going to absolutely be necessary. Um, there's a huge increase uh, in demand for metals. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details of this, this paper by Elsh Khaki at all, but basically under a whole bunch of different economic scenarios, which are essentially a scenario similar to today, um, to scenarios where the earth or the world share, shares all their resources in kind of a, a globally, uh, uh, everybody just shares resources for the good of the earth. In, in either case, in, in any of these cases, we can see that that uh, demand for these metals is, is constantly increasing. And one of the things that is, is really uh, kind of key here is if you look at these diagrams on the right, what we see is all of a sudden we start to see these yellow and red areas. And what these yellow and red areas represent is uh, when minerals start to become scarce or they become depleted. And there's a really interesting paper that was, that was done by Moreau et al. just a couple of years ago, uh, talking about uh, modeling metal depletion horizons for various key metals that we use in society. And you can see that if the line is green all the way across, we're good to go till at least 2090. There's not gonna be any issue with, with supply of those metals, but it's these metals where we all of a sudden see the orange and the black, the orange, the orange and the black. Uh, the black is basically when our resources would be depleted based on what we know is in the ground right now. And so this is a, something we really have to come to terms with is how do we get so that we can extend these uh, depletion horizons out because clearly we're going to be needing to use these metals in the future as as we continue to to develop uh, society and 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 the world uh, uh, standards of, standards of living continue to improve and so um, this is just a really uh, humbling diagram to look at as an economic geologist because it puts a lot of pressure on us for we have to figure out one where to find these resources in the ground. But as a metallurgist, we have to figure out how do we take the resources that we've used and reutilize them in an effective way. One of the things that's really also humbling about this is the fact that if we mine a metal and put it into a product, it's basically, it's being utilized, 
but it it's no longer a resource because it's being held up in its in its current use. And so we can't think about uh, you know the copper that's in copper wire right now as as a, a resource for the future because it may be held up uh, in that in that use for for a long period of time. So we have to think about ways to get the other copper that we need or the other uh, you could use any metal basically. Uh, uh, for what for what we need. If you're tying something up in a resource, it's no longer available. So you got to you got to be thinking about that. It will be available at the end of its its product life, and that's where we hope to be able to recycle it or reutilize it. Um, there was an interesting uh, paper that came out, a publication back in 2020, um, by the World Bank, and it's a big 100 page plus report describing predictions up to 2050 regarding minerals use. As we transition from the carbon-based energy sources to the renewable energy resources, and so I'm just going to very quickly go over the findings of that report as they were expressed within the the executive summary. Um, and really, what they come down to is minerals are going to be really important for this. Um, a low-carbon future will be very mineral intensive because clean energy technologies need more materials than fossil fuel-based electricity generation technologies. Each mineral carries a dis different demand risk, depending on whether it's cross-cutting, used across a range of these technologies, or concentrated only in one technology. Absolute production numbers and relative increases in demand for each mineral may play a role in their ability to meet supply, as well as to have climate and environmental implications. Technology and subtechnology choice, material substitution, and technological improvements will shift the demand for individual minerals under different low carbon scenarios. A lot of those predictions that, that we had were, were based on utilizing today's technology. If we innovate and we develop new technologies, we can extend the life of those, those minerals because we may be able to use less of them in the products that we need. In any case, any low carbon pathway is still gonna increase the overall demand for minerals. Um, while the recycling and reuse of minerals can play a key role in reducing emissions, mining will still be required to supply the critical minerals needed to produce these low carbon technologies, even with large future increases in recycling rates. We're always going to need to have some primary resource available because as we develop this, um, we're, we're, we're utilizing this metal in a new way. And so we're gonna need more of it to be able to expand those new technologies. Despite the higher mineral intensity of renewable ener energy technologies, the scale of associated greenhouse gas emissions is a fracture of that of fossil fuel technologies. However, the carbon and materials footprint can't be overlooked. Even to develop these new, new minerals and to do, develop these new mineral technologies, we have to, we have to continually keep, keep on the books what the carbon footprint of, of that is. And limiting the carbon footprint of minerals needed for the clean energy transition may offer double wins, helping to boost economic growth and reduce environmental risk in resource-rich developing countries. And it will also enable basically a transition to a, a 1.5 to 2 degree pathway um, in line with the Paris Agreement Sustainable Goals 7 and 13, 7 being access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, and 13 being urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Um, so with that said, just very briefly, in that report, they talk about kind of the key elements that are gonna be part of uh, the low carbon technologies up till 2050. And on the left, I've shown just a, 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 a diagram that was taken right from that report, indicating some of the metals, including things like aluminum, chromium, cobalt, et cetera. If you look at these, a lot of these would be, it would have been ones that were circled in red, on that diagram uh, uh, on the uh, metal wheel that I showed previously. And I just wanted to show this diagram, which talks about the compositions of the various battery technologies and the use of these critical metals within lots of these different technologies. Um, so again, uh, we're thinking about this, this new economy. We're thinking about kind of circular economy. We're thinking about trying to make the world greener. Um, minerals are going to be a key component of it, and a lot of times it's the critical metals um, that that play a key role in in being able to afford that. And and you know, energy storage is going to be a really big deal. Um, wind power and solar power are great, 
but they're limited by when the wind blows and when the sun shines. And so energy storage is going to become absolutely vital on a large scale in order to improve uh, renewable energy resources on the large electrical grids. And here's just from that World Bank report again, kind of uh, showing the, the expected growth under uh, different Different uh, uh, different climate uh, tech or different climate scenarios for the potential growth of, of energy storage um, uh, up till 2050, and you can see it's 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 roughly goes from about three up to about 46 by 2050. So we're we're talking about a uh, an increase in about of about 15 times just associated with energy storage. Uh, and as we think about the transition to low carbon tech, uh, society. You know, a lot of times you think about different things like batteries and things like that. So I just wanted to show the makeup of some of these batteries. Um, again, lots and lots of critical metals go into a lithium ion battery. And, you know, being able to recycle these is gonna be important so that we can continue to reutilize these, these key components, okay? Um, if we take a look at uh, solar uh, photovoltaic cells, again, Lots of kind of rare and trace metals involved in, in the development of those technologies. Uh, these are, again, the critical metals that, that we're talking about um, uh, that, are, that have been listed by the US and, uh, and other governments. And if we go into uh, wind supply, um, you can see that you know, neodymium dysprosium, two rare earth elements, really go into making the rare earth magnets that are so powerful that help to make these generators much more efficient. Obviously, lots of copper and aluminum and steel, you know, things that we think of as kind of, you know, everyday, everyday, uh, everyday metals, uh, key components in, in all of this. So there's a whole variety of metals that go into making this, this new low carbon society. And I think it's important to understand that, um, yes, some of these are, are metals that we have uh, large quantities of that we're not going to see depletion of, but, but others... Um, are very limited resources based on our knowledge today. And we've got to understand how to utilize these more effectively, how to increase exploration uh, success rates and how to process them in an environmentally way that's, that's sustainable. Um, so these are really kind of the key things that we got to be thinking about. So, so uh, I'm just going to finish off very quickly with talking about some of the things that we're doing um, at the Natural Resources Research Institute and some of the things that that we have to think about as we develop a, a, a circular economy approach or uh, toward, toward, uh, uh, pro, uh, toward managing mineral resources. First thing is you gotta know what you're working with. And that, that includes what, 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 you're, what you're dealing with in terms of chemical elements, but also what are the risks and, and rewards associated with development of those, of those resource, resources, excuse me. Um, innovation in developing extractive technologies is really going to be paramount. We've got to be better at our mineralogical processing and our metallurgical processing. We always have to keep in mind that the value of what's coming out of the pipe at the end of the process is just as important and maybe even more important uh, as the resource and its potential products. This really gets at kind of social license issues that we, that we talked about. We have to be better and innovate in terms of metallurgical processing for recycling. As I showed you, our recycling rates, you know, for some metals are really good, but for other metals, are, they're, they're, they, they certainly could use some improvement. Um, extractive technologies, whatever ones we develop, need to minimize potential environmental consequences. This is really key. Uh, one of the things that, that we have to do in the circular economy is use as much of the resource as possible. So not only the ore, the co-products and the byproducts, but how can we utilize the waste materials uh, for other uses that are, that are productive that minimize these wastes and also bring value to the overall resource? We have to develop closer, we have to develop higher value products closer to the resource. Think about, you know, one of the things we think about right now here in Northern Minnesota is we take the iron ore from the range, we, we grind it up, we heat it up to produce taconite pellets, um, and they're hot when they come out of, the, out of the kilns. Then we ship them down the railway to Duluth and what do they do? They cool off. Then we put them in a big ship that's pumping out all kinds of CO2 so we can send this stuff down to uh, lower parts of the Great Lakes to be processed in, in, in uh, you know, iron ore plants, say. 
And what do we do there? We take that material that's now cooled and we completely reheat it up again uh, to, to, to melt off the slag and, and get the iron and, and produce the steel. Um, you know, that's not a very efficient process when you think about it in terms of, of CO2 and in terms of, of energy. Um, if you develop higher value products closer to the resource, you can minimize that. Um, we have to engineer products so they can be recycled. This is all about re-inputting a product at the end of its life cycle back into that circular economy loop. We need to think about ways that infrastructure developed during mining and for that matter, minerals processing or metallurgical processing can be utilized after the mining mineral processing or metallurgical processing has ceased. And we had to understand that new technological developments, social regulatory and political aspects and recycling will all play key roles in uh, understanding uh, or in developing our, our ability to supply metals. So if we go back to Minnesota's hard rock portfolio, um, I wanna just bring out the fact that, that Minnesota has the longest geological history of any of the continental United States, of any of the states in the United States for that matter. And Minnesota is really blessed by that because if you have a long period of time in geology, that enables lots of different kinds of processes to occur. And in some cases, those processes may be related to formation of ores. And so Minnesota, you know, we know we're extremely well endowed in terms of our iron ore. We have a really nice endowment relative to the United States in terms of manganese. And we have the richest uh, undeveloped copper, nickel, platinum deposit, deposits in North America, if not the world, uh, sitting right here in the, in the Duluth complex. So we're very mineral endowed. Um, we also have to remember though that um, we have to think about things like the environment and water. So when we think about development of these things, it's, it's that whole perspective that I've been trying to show in the, the, the earlier parts of this talk where we have to make all these considerations related to economy, environment, social license, all these types of things to make smart decisions about, about which ways to go in terms of developing our minerals resources. Um, with that said, one of the things that we're working very closely with the Minnesota Geological Survey and with the Minnesota Department of uh, Natural Resources Lands and Minerals Division uh, is, is a big project with the US Geological Survey called the USGS Earth MRI Project. And the Earth uh, MRI Project, uh, MRI stands for Mapping Resources Initiative, is really a collaboration between the states and the USGS to understand uh, the framework for our potential for having certain critical metals within the, United, within the United States. And back when I started working on this project, back in, uh, I guess it would have been 2019, um, these were the 35 critical minerals that were indicated by, by the US uh, government at that time. There's uh, some great publications that came out in December of 2017 that coincided with uh, 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 Donald Trump's executive order to uh, look for critical minerals within the, uh, understand the critical mineral resources of, of the United States. Um, in, in 2021, that list has grown from 35 to now it's 50. And what I've shown in this diagram is that Minnesota has the potential to have resources, I think it's 48 or 49 of these 50. And the ones that are in bold are ones that we absolutely know that we have and are currently either being produced or are under, under um, uh, consideration for development. Um, the other thing that we're working on right now uh, is developing these projects. The project that we're currently working on is up here in this area of Northwestern Minnesota called the Mentor Project. This purple blob right here is what's called the Mentor Intrusion. It has the highest vanadium values in the, in the, in the Minnesota for any, any uh, igneous rock. And so we're working with the USGS to understand the Abitibi-Wawa belt here, the Quetico, as well as the Wabagoon belt to understand the critical metals resources. These are other areas that we've written up what we call focus area descriptions. And this shows what we think may be possible in understanding what kinds of critical mineral resources are there. Another big project that is just the decisions are coming out on this as we speak literally is what's called the Department of Energy's ARPA-E Open 2021 project. And it really has key programs related to minerals and minerals processing 
that are really all about the circular economy related to iron and steel, underground mines and wells, how we process mineral ores, how we use uh, different minerals to sequester carbon dioxide, as well as sequester carbon dioxide and extract critical metals, and then utilization of, of wastes. And so really what, if we think about it in terms of iron in Minnesota, today we're producing taconite pellets. Our ultimate goal is to produce really high value products such as pig iron or nodular reduced iron. If you can see the, the prices for these things, and these are prices from about, oh, about six months ago per ton. Um, but you know, there's, there's four times the value in producing a, a reduced uh, iron nugget, uh, which is like 97% iron relative to producing a taconite pellet, which is only about 65% iron. So really what we're trying to do at the NRI and the programs that I run is move to the upper right on this curve to uh, have higher value products and, and to these, these will produce less waste and will make better use of the, of the resource. Um, we can talk, uh, get into specifics. I know I'm starting to run a little bit long, but there's a whole bunch of things for, for how we think about mining waste. We have to understand it from a geometallurgical point of view and economic point of view. We have to think about social dimensions, social license aspects of using waste, and then as well as the geo-environmental aspects. And really, how does that all fit within the circular economy? To really fundamentally answer the question, how can the mining, of uh, the mining industry create new economic value, minimize its social and environmental impacts, and diminish liability for mining wastes? We really want to be pushing in that direction. Uh, the Canadian government uh, has a, a group called the Canadian Mining Innovation Council. It's a really interesting group that really is thinking about 10 to 20 to 30 years ahead. What are the problems that we need to solve in mining? And really the key things that they're looking at include exploration, environment, how do we do underground mining more safely and effectively, as well as energy consumption. These all are things that go into that circular economy uh, uh, conversation that, that we've been talking about for the past hour or so. So just a couple of quick things uh, related to what we're doing at the NRI. One of the things that we continue to work on and we've, we've developed patents for is this taconite, uh, utilization of taconite tailings to make literally indestructible pothole patches. And many of you have probably seen, there's been all kinds of, I think it was KSTP and WCCO and, and the Tri Star Tribune have run articles on this. Uh, it's a really unique material where we take uh, taconite uh, uh, um, processing wastes and we mix it with various components, all environmentally friendly components, and we can produce a pothole patch that you can drive over in 10 minutes. Um, many of you probably are NASCAR fans and probably recall back about, I don't know, it might've been six or eight years ago when the Daytona 500 was held up for about three or four hours because they got a pothole on one of the turns. Man, I tell you, if I would have had a private jet, I would have brought about 50 pounds of this stuff down. The race would have gotten going in an hour. It would have been really kind of kind of interesting. But this stuff is, is really kind of a unique thing. The other thing that's really gaining a lot of ground is, is Minnesota, because of our preponderance of mafic rocks, things like gabbros and basalts, has lots and lots of olivine. And olivine tends to be one of the minerals that can react with carbon dioxide quite effectively to, uh, in a reaction where we basically take olivine, we react it with carbon dioxide, and we make a magnesium carbonate mineral called magnesite as, and quartz. By doing this, you take the carbon dioxide gas out of the atmosphere and you store it as a mineral in the ground in perpetuity. And so there's a lot of uh, current research going on on this. One of the things is that olivine also can contain trace amounts of things like nickel and cobalt. It's two of those uh, uh, critical metals that are key for the new, the new renewable economy. And so there's a lot of research going on right now as well that is it taking place to understand if we can not only sequester carbon dioxide using olivine, but also pull the nickel and cobalt out of it as a, as a byproduct. Um, Basically, just wanted to show that uh, tailings from mafic ore deposits in terms of, of uh, economics is, is quite economically effective, but the tonnages are relatively low based on other types of carbon storage technologies that are out there. 
And again, just Minnesota has lots of these favorable rocks for doing carbon sequestration. This is a map from the, the USGS specifically related to uh, uh, rocks that can be related to carbon sequestration. Uh, post mining infrastructure, I talked about very briefly. Um, we have to think about how to utilize the infrastructure and in mines once those mines are gone for, for different kinds of things. And one of the things that we've looked at over the past six or eight years at the NRI is, is how can we utilize mining infrastructure for renewable energy storage? Um, and, and that can be pumped hydro energy storage, which I'll talk about in a second, as well as compressed air energy storage. And when we think about this energy storage, what we're thinking about are, are really big batteries. And so we're, we really wanna go from uh, in this process about thinking, thinking about going from the Energizer Bunny to going to the Energizer Godzilla, okay? Uh, we really want to go big, okay? So in terms of, of pumped hydro technology, basically we utilize water. We have an upper reservoir. We have a lower turbine system. Um, you need about 100 to 150 meters of elevation for this type of system to work based on on uh, the, the current technologies. And basically what you do is when the wind isn't blowing, you drain this upper reservoir, run it through a turbine. Um, and that's basically storing kinetic energy and turning it into electrical energy that can go to the grid. And then when the wind is blowing at night, we're not using that energy, you, you turn that turbine around and you pump that water back up to the reservoir to be used again. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, and this is, uh, really, so off peak, you pump to the upper reservoir and during high peak hours, you let gravity drain the water to run a turbine to produce electricity. Another really interesting uh, uh, technique for doing this is, is to use what's, what's called um, uh, um, uh, compressed air energy storage. And in this model here, this is from a Canadian company called Hydrostore. Um, if you're really interested in this kind of technology, check out their site. It's a really interesting site. I actually was able to visit their pilot plant on Toronto Island back about five years ago. It's really interesting. But what they basically do is utilize a combination of water and they compress air. And then when they, when they need to, uh, uh, you know, th this is all by this compressed air, they're storing energy in this air. Uh, when they compress this air, they actually capture the heat from the air. Um, there's thermodynamic things that happen when you compress air, you produce heat. And so you want to store that heat. They've got materials that can do that. And when they need the, when they need the, uh, the energy, they basically pump the air back out to drive a turbine. And then when they don't need the energy, they basically uh, allow the, the, um, the water to, to, uh, come, to, to come to a, a level so that they can, again, pressurize that air and uh, um, uh, basically... Uh, uh, store energy for the next cycle. Um, one of the things in Minnesota, uh, if we look at the Cuyuna district, for example, this big map just shows the, the mapped underground workings at one of the armor, at the armor number one mine uh, located in the, in the Cuyuna district. And you can see there's an enormous amount of underground uh, resource for doing something like a compressed air energy storage system. Now, this would all have to be looked at in very detailed engineering studies before we can understand the full feasibility of it. But we know that those types of, uh, those types of uh, underground caverns do exist in Minnesota. So as I start to wrap up here, um, the global community really needs to plan for potential inadequate mineral supplies over the next few decades. We're gonna really have to consider global dependence on critical minerals, um, as well as the vulnerable and flexible nature of mineral resource availability. And so we need to reach a consensus on international targets for global mineral production, okay? We need to monitor the impacts of mineral production and consumption, improve coordinated mineral exploration efforts to know what we need to be focusing on in terms of key metals, uh, support investment and research into new mineral extraction technologies. And as an exploration geologist, I'd also say support investment in and understanding how it can improve the efficiency of exploration, um, harmonize our best practices for responsible mineral resource development. In other words, hold all of us ourselves up to high standards for sustainability and develop maps and inventories showing where recyclable metals are so that we can think about ways to produce high value products close to those resources. Um, 
Again, we need to plan for potential inadequate supplies over the next few decades. And uh, we really need to, to understand uh, how, this, how this is all gonna work given the, the vulnerability and flexible, flexibility of metals markets. So in terms of the circular economy and mineral resources, fundamentally, if we're gonna be able to develop a circular economy, we've gotta know what we're working with. We have to maximize use of the resource. And by that, I mean, not only the ore, but the co-products, byproducts, infrastructure and waste materials. We have to develop processes and new technologies with the concept that what's coming out of the pipe at the end is just as valuable as the resource at the beginning of the pipe. This is really the application of the life cycle thinking I talked about. Develop our higher value products closer to the resource. This minimizes energy consumption to produce, uh, to produce those products. Employ life cycle thinking in the development, manufacturing of products. We, we think about how to put them together in the beginning so we understand how to take them apart at the end so we can re reutilize those resources. And we want to think about employing life cycle thinking with respect to really expensive and large mining related infrastructure. And again, all this is going to require excellence in geological, environmental, metallurgical, chemical, and social sciences, as well as engineering to succeed. So is a, is a circular economy for mineral resources possible? Um, personally, I think conceptually, it's, a, it's an aspirational goal. But as, as indicated in many studies, we will always need to, to mine new resources. And that has to do with product quality, new demands, higher demands, availability of resources, et cetera. Um, realistically, uh, the circular economy will not be achievable in the near future um, because of resource availability issues, uh, things like supply chain issues, technological barriers, uh, efficiency issues, things like that. Government policies are gonna need to play a key role in enabling us to get uh, closer to a circular economy. And, and that really gets at these, these last few items that I, that I indicated on the pre previous slide about global cooperation with respect to sustainability. And we have, uh, have to be able to uh, have a mechanism for investments to overcome technological, social, environmental, and economic challenges. It's gonna take money to, to think about how to develop these new technologies. So with that said, I apologize for going a little bit long, um, but I, I thank you and I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. This is Dave Wilhelm. Um, there's two questions in the chat that I've seen. Um, okay. So let's get to those. And if people have other questions, um, you can put them in chat. Or if you think it's long, if you want to be unmuted, we can uh, we can let you uh, ask the question directly. Um, but I'll get the ones that are in the chat right now. Uh, from Doug, the question, how does the NRRI relate to what I believe was called the Iron Range Rehabilitation Board. Yeah, so the, the IRRRB, Iron Range Rehabilitation, um, uh, Iron Range, Iron Range Rehabilitation, Iron Range Resources Rehabilitation Board, yeah. In any case, um, they're, a, they're a Minnesota state agency where we're part of the university. But we do work collaboratively to uh, evaluate uh, um, uh, different uh, opportunities with respect to two minerals. Um, one of the things uh, that that uh, um, I can talk about, for example, uh, a recent uh, collaboration between the NRI and uh, um, the the IRRB, or what's now known as the Department of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation. Um, is, is some of the work that I did with respect to critical metals, uh, hydrometallurgical processing. Um, one of the things that we've, and, if, and you can go to the website, the NRI website and download these things. Um, but one of the things that we looked at is we have, I, I talked about it briefly in the earlier part of our, our, our discussion of are these really kind of weird oxide rich rocks that we call the oxide ultramafic intrusions, or if we want to use our best Valentine's Day French, the wheeze, okay, OUIs. Um, in any case, they have really high, high potential for, well, they have high contents of vanadium and titanium. And they've never really been looked at because 
The titanium mineral that uh, is in those is called ilmenite, uh, FETIO3 is the chemical formula. But the ilmenite within the Minnesota resources has a little bit too much magnesium in its crystal structure to allow it to produce a pure white powder. So a couple of years ago, we, we did a, a kind of a, a, we did a bench scale study. We then did a pilot, an initial pilot scale study. And we found out that by using a, a kind of a proprietary hydrometallurgical technique, we were able to produce a 99% plus purity TiO2 powder. We, we basically eliminated the magnesium from the product by using this. Um, one of the things that was a follow-up to that was when you do this hydrometallurgical processing with the titanium, the fluids that are left after you extract the titanium uh, build up vanadium contents. And so the, the IRRRB or the DIRRR as they are now um, gave us a small grant to do a bent scale study to understand whether or not we could extract that vanadium from those, those hydrometallurgical processing liquids and see if we could produce pure, pure, uh, really high purity vanadium products. And we were able to produce two high purity, greater than 99% uh, products, uh, uh, um, uh, ammonium metavanidate, which is a precursor that goes into making uh, batteries as, as well as um, vanadium pentoxide, which also is used to make things in, in the renewable batteries technology. So uh, there's a partnership between the IRRRB and the NRI um, in which we evaluate potential uh, processes for, for that, that may relate to the economic growth within the Northeast part of the state. Thank you, George. Um, next question here is from Mark. Is it fair to say that these minerals in the Duluth and to the West cannot be extracted without water contamination? That, you know, that's a tough question because it's really beyond my, my expertise on this. Um, uh, I think what there, there have been a lot of experiments that have been done. Um, some of them have shown that some of those materials can be acid producing, but in other cases, the, the waste materials can, um, can buffer those solutions so that you get near neutral pH fluids. Um, I think it really, it, it's, it's a hard question to answer because it really, each mineral resource is like a person. They're different things and there's different things that there's different physical and chemical properties related to each of those mineral resources. So they really have to be understood on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and I, I certainly don't have the data or the knowledge uh, in the detail that's the, on that case-by-case -case basis to be able to answer that question. I, I wish I could. Um, you know, the DNR has uh, quite a bit of information uh, related to things like uh, the polymet uh, with respect to the EIS. I also know they have a, a site uh, that talks a little bit about the Twin Metals Project. Um, and I, I would refer, refer you there to uh, see what they have to say on that because they've, they've done much more of that, that type of work than I have. So uh, I, I would just refer you to, to those uh, resources. They'll be able to give you a much better answer than I could. Thank you, George. Um, the next question is from Mary Kay. Um, I love your concrete examples, the pothole patches. I assume that's a pun intended there. Um, do you have any others you could share? Yeah, the pothole patch one in terms of minerals uh, is really our farthest project along. Um, but we've got some things that uh, are, are in the works I, I, I really can't talk about right now. Um, but there are other mineral products that, that we're looking at developing. But the pothole patch is certainly the one that, um, you know, all of us that live in, North, in Minnesota, uh, we know about potholes. So that one kind of hits close to home. So I think that's a, that's a great example. And I encourage you to get online, just do a Google search on NRI pothole patch, and you'll probably get 20 or 30 different references, including YouTube videos and newspaper articles and things like that, that, that go into more detail on, on that. It's a really incredible thing. And um, I mean, I, I've seen it, I, I've actually been involved with 
with the, um, uh, mixing the materials and putting them in the hole and watching them form and then going out to places in Duluth where we've applied this material five or six years ago and it's still holding up. It's, it's amazing stuff. Um, sometimes it doesn't hold up as well. It's like painting. If you don't do the prep work ahead of time, it's not gonna work out well. And, and it's the same exact thing with pothole patch. You have to prep that material, the, the materials that you want it to bond with in the appropriate way so that you get a good bond and then it'll be, it'll be very robust. But uh, uh, just, like, just like woodworking or painting or anything like that, it's all about the preparation. Um, but yeah, the pothole patch is, uh, is really the, the key one. There, there's gonna be other ones coming out um, uh, uh, in the near future. Um, that that you'll you'll see, I'm sure. With our our marketing department is is not shy about when we have new products coming out that uh, they let everybody know about it. Okay, kind of a follow up to that. Uh, for instance, in the Twin Cities here, when would we actually expect to see these patches being applied as a as a matter of course, or at least you know a large percentage. Yeah, so right now, I mean, there are there are materials out there that are on the market. You can go to Menards and buy this this kind of stuff. Um, uh, what we're trying to do is is really um, focus on the the fact that we're utilizing mine waste and we can develop a a product that's equally as durable, if not better, um, using using our 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 stuff. Um, right now, we're really, you know, there's been lots of trials. Um, we have some patents on this material, um, but nothing has gone to market yet. We haven't produced it in a market quantity. And that's something that we're currently working on right now is developing the, the business model and the, the way to, to, to make this uh, available. So I would say uh, one to three, one to five years, something like that. It takes a while to develop this stuff, but um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that out to market, uh, certainly before I retire. So. Okay. It also seems like it would mean hauling material, let's say, from up on the Iron Range down to the Twin Cities, quite a bit of bulk material. Would you agree? Yeah. One, one of the things that, you know, there's, there's a blessing and there's a, and there's a uh, uh, you know, bad parts to this, this material setting up so quickly. The blessing is it sets up so quickly that, um, that you're able to uh, uh, get a pothole patch and drive over it very quickly. Kind of the, the bad aspects of it is it sets up so quickly that if you try to do it in large quantities, uh, the material sets up before you have enough time to work it. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to understand of how to, how to be able to control those, uh, the, the setup rates in this material so that, that you can do it. Um, I think what, with the pothole patch that that, that we're developing um, initially, it would probably be for kind of small applications, um, but certainly thinking about how larger applications um, would, would, be, uh, would be able to be done is really something that, that, that's on our minds. You know, one of the things that the highway departments love about the fast setting pothole patch, there's actually two things. One is, you have to work it so quickly, you never see anybody leaning on a shovel on the side of the highway. So from a PR perspective, it's, it's really interesting, but it's a really important safety thing because you can get those workers that are on the highway, on the highway and off the highway very quickly to take them out of harm's way because this stuff sets up so quickly. So those are some of the key things that, that we're, we're hoping to build on as we, as we develop this. Um, but um, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Dave. Um, uh, the um, you know large amounts of materials might have to go down there. Uh, obviously, the most effective way to do that probably would be by rail. But that's way beyond where where we're thinking at at this point right now. Um, we're thinking about something that would be kind of a smaller uh, application initially. Okay. Um, right now, there's one last comment, which means if anybody else has a question, now's the time to get it in there. Um, this is a comment from Mary Helen, but you might be able to uh, uh, elaborate on it, uh, George. One of the aspects needed is to make badly needed recycling easier for the end consumer, including those of us who do not drive cars and thus can't haul large items over distances, as well as pushing the 
right to repair concept. And excellent talk is her final comment. Yeah, I yeah. That, thank you, Mary Mary Helen, for that question. Um, yeah, you know, uh, as a as a PhD researcher in the university, we make a lot of jokes about kind of the egghead geeks that have blinders on. And we're so focused on kind of the technological and the, the technological barriers and things like that. We forget to think about the obvious, like how do people get stuff into recycling in the first place? And I think that's a really absolutely important point because I mean, uh, if, if those materials don't have a way to get back into that circular economy stream so they can be recycled, it, the circular economy doesn't work, right? Um, so uh, that's a really good point. Um, I, I wish I had some more information on that, but I really don't. Um, but you've whetted my appetite on this. That's a, just a wonderful question. And I, I'm gonna, tomorrow I can tell you, I'm gonna try to understand what, what mechanisms are. Certainly this is something that, you know, as, as a, a, a public that wants to uh, contribute, you know, it might be an interesting question for, I don't know, your city representatives or your state representatives or something like that, whether or not there's some kind of programs that, that are out there. I certainly don't know about them, um, but, but uh, or something that, that could be developed. This sounds like a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to uh, increase the amount of materials that end up going back into that circular economy loop. Um, and I, I think that's just great. Hey, George, uh, Steve Erickson here. Yeah. Um, what lessons have been learned from the, the shutting down kind of the, the permitting process for the mindset that were just kind of closed off? What can we learn from that? What can we, how can we either restart or not make the same mistake the next time around? Because we're going to always run into this. Somebody's going to say, no, you can't. Whenever you talk about a new mine, um, is there something we can do beforehand or is there something that the companies are going to try to do this need to do a better job of what what do you think there yeah i i certainly can't speak to the companies i think what what it comes down to um fundamentally is that that whole discussion that brief discussion i had about social license and being able for for uh the companies um for the scientific uh, data um, to be translated in such a way um, that people can understand what it all means. Not all of us are aqueous geochemists and not all of us are economic geologists or minerals processing people or air scientists for that matter. Um, so being able to communicate things in an effective way is certainly part of it. And ultimately I think that gets down to the whole social license thing being able to gain that social license. It, it's interesting and that's a great question um, because I was at a um, uh, back about, I guess this would have been a back about eight or 10 years ago, I was at the Wisconsin, the first SME meeting of the Wisconsin chapter for something like 15 or 20 years. And um, uh, I gave a talk there a little bit on mineral resources, but there was a, uh, a gentleman that gave a talk about social license. And it was the first time I had really heard about this concept. And it's really interesting. His talk was really interesting. And one thing stuck with me, which was that of the, there were, I think at that time, something on the order of, I don't know, it was like a dozen and a half or two dozen minerals projects that were uh, valued at well over a billion dollars that were in development worldwide. And 90% of those projects were being held up. And for 90% of those, 90% of those projects, what was holding them up was not the technical issues and, or the environmental issues, it was the social license issues. And so I think social license is a really key component that needs to be, needs to be stressed because as we move forward, the social license is, is something that absolutely is going to need to be achieved in order to be able to uh, uh, develop uh, projects within within uh, within areas. Um, you have to gain that trust of the community and the 
the stakeholders in order to be able to make that happen. And so I think, uh, you know, communication, being able to communicate things, um, you know, certainly transparency is, is very important. Um, uh, certainly, uh, um, you know, being able to show that you mean well is all part of that social license thing. And so I think, you know, ultimately it, uh, the social license aspect of it is very important. You know, I can't speak for, you know, what specifically what individual companies have done in the past or that, um, but, uh, but I will say that, that in, in, you know, it, this has happened in the chemical business over the past 25, 30 years. Um, you know, those of us that are old enough to remember Bhopal, right, uh, and, and, and what happened there, that, that all gets at, you know, uh, having an industrial facility in a, in a community um, and, and they, you have to be able to ensure people that you have the safeguards to be able to do it, to do it well. Um, and so um, I think, again, the social license stuff is really kind of key to that whole, whole thing. Thank you, George. Appreciate you coming on tonight. Uh, I don't know. Any other questions, Dave? You see? Any uh, more? There's one more. It's, it's a comment, but I'm going to read it. And then if there's anybody else that wants to question verbally, they can unmute themselves. But uh, the comment is from Craig. He said, thanks for reviewing the guiding principles of NRRI at the start of the talk, as it gave us context for how the research center approaches problem solving. Terrific presentation. Oh, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. So I'll give people a few seconds if I don't hear anybody speak, and we're going to uh, we're going to uh, just thank George and say and call it a night. Well, thank you, George. Thank well, you, George. Have a good night. Thank yeah, you, everyone, thank you for joining thank, us. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for this opportunity. Um, you guys uh, um, have my my email, uh, so you know if a uh, question comes up, don't hesitate to contact me. I'd be more than happy to communicate back with you if uh, you know you wake up at three in the morning with this burning question in your mind tonight or something. So uh, just uh, feel free to contact me anytime. More than happy to engage in a conversation or engage in a dialogue. So thank you. Yeah, th this is Dave. I sent out the lecture uh, announcement. So. Uh... If you have a question, just email, you know, do a reply email and I'll uh, get the question to George. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Very good. And uh, we, we have everyone. recorded this. We have recorded this. So the recording will be made available in a few days. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.